from uh, Delhi in India. Uh, this is something that's fascinated me, sir, because let's be blunt. Are you saying they shouldn't have been bailed out, that, if you will, the Darwinian theory would have moved forward? Yes, some would have lost money. Richard, you know, what I'm trying to do here is to say that every action has its consequences. So in 2008, we did massive bailouts. And at the first hint of any trouble in this Fed tightening campaign, in the form of SVB nearly going uh, bust, we went ahead and did a big bailout here in America. What I'm trying to say is that, yes, we probably saved the system if you think that's what is the worst consequence. But the side effect of this, we saw this after 2008, we've been seeing this systematically ever since this rescue culture became all pervasive beginning in the 1980s or so, is that productivity in the economy keeps declining. The number of zombie companies keeps increasing in the economy. And a few large companies get all the benefit because they're the incumbents, they're the ones which are entrenched. And so they're the ones that get to... Uh, roll on. So I think that there is a very clear trade-off here, that you okay. can save the system. Yeah. OK, you can save the system or you can save, if you will. Uh, but but the, 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 the reality is that you would have, I, I, and I'm on the fence here myself because I can see both sides, right. you would have small to medium-sized businesses that might have a couple of million dollars in the bank, therefore uninsured, if the bank goes down, then they can't make payroll, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do in this situation today? Right. As I said, that in every single instance when there's a bailout, it sounds very heartless to suggest anything else. What I'm trying to say is that every time you do that, it builds up. And there are consequences for that. So, uh, so yes, even in this case, it sounds heartless to say, oh, they should have all been allowed to go bust because it instantly brings back images of the liquidationists going back to the Great Depression. But here is the really important point, which is that every time we do this, we think we are helping the small person, the small business. We are, in fact, helping the very large companies. What's happened since the 10th of March uh, when this crisis broke out? The mega caps, the very large companies, have benefited the most anyway, because that's where capital has rushed. That's where investors have uh, rushed. So, if you look at the so uh, on that issue, then, I, I agree it's, it's not a, a complete either or. But if faced with the choice, the risk of not having disruptors and churn versus the known effect of uh, small companies who banked with those things going out of business. Um, which is the better policy decision to take? In the long term, if you want to have capitalism, then allowing more companies to fail is the right and, uh, way to go. America's had a very long history, and so has Europe, of having banking runs. Uh, but of course, now what's happened is that because the financial system has become this huge monster, where the size of the financial markets, the stock and the bond markets put together today, is five times larger than the size of the underlying economy, compared to the fact that it used to be about equal, we are very scared, obviously, because every time something flutters in the financial economy, we are concerned it will bring down the entire real economy. The right. problem is that what system do we want? Do we want capitalism? We want socialism. If we want capitalism, then allowing more companies to go bust. Why are default rates so low? Uh, after all, you know that having defaults is an integral part of capitalism, okay. uh, uh, as long as like, it's reasonable. So right. it's a very clear trade-off. that, And yeah. it's a very uh, choice we need to make as to which system we want and what are we comfortable with. Now, I have the traffic lights with me here in the studio because we've had economic data. We had inflation numbers, which look good, look better, but not there yet, still over 2%. And we had the Fed minutes, A, saying possible of recession because of the banking crisis, B, thinking of pausing. Now, take all that you've heard today on the economic front. Is it red, things are getting worse? Amber, we're pretty much where we are. Or green, well, things are looking a lot better than they were. 
So, red, amber, or green, where would you like me to click? I would, st <laughs> I would still say amber because nothing much has changed as far as the data is concerned, which is that we expected inflation to come down. But if you look at core inflation, it's still quite sticky. It's taking much longer to come off than I think anybody had expected even a year ago. So I think that, yes, the headline inflation's down, core inflation's down a bit in terms of at least the rate of change, but it's being much more sticky. Therefore, my uh, forecast is that the underlying inflation that we have is likely to settle at somewhere close to 3 to 4% rather than the sub-2% number we have got used to over the past decade. We'll talk more about it, sir. Grateful you have an amber, and we move on. Thank you, sir.